I was just told this meeting is being recorded. So then we we proceeded to um, work with a consultant to de to develop a memorials policy and come up with some precedent options for people to choose from so that we don't get a mishmash of items out in our parks and we don't want to create something and that looked kind of like a cemetery. So um, with that, we developed our first park policy, which was pretty exciting. Um, and I thought, okay, good. We got started. We'll take a little break. And then I was told that some, some guy was holding this public treasure hunt in one of our parks on a Saturday. And I'm like, I had no idea. Is it a buried treasure? I no clue. So I Googled him and I found out that he has several of these treasure hunts that he charges families $50 per family to participate in these treasure hunts. And then he hides a treasure in a public park. Well, so now I thought, well, now we need another permit, don't we? <laughs> or a policy and a permit. So um, then we worked on another one, like a special events permit. So I thought, I wonder what other policies we are missing here in Sherburne County. And I wonder um, what policies other park departments have. So that's what this discussion is about. And I'm hoping we can kind of go around and talk about um, the policies that we have in place and um, then maybe talk about how that came to be, whether it was through a formal um, policy needs analysis or just kind of we developed them on an as needed basis. So um, I just um, open it up first to introductions. And I kind of forgot to do that. Sorry. Um, so we'll start with that and then we'll start our discussion. Brad's not looking, so he doesn't get to go first. Carlin, do you want to go first? Yep, I sure do. I'm Carlin Ziegler, I'm the Olmsted County Parks Director down in um, District 6 in the Rochester area. Um, and I thought this was a really great forum for Gina, uh, Gina to bring up. Um, I'm also the communications chair for Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails. Um, so she's right, we've we've also been talking about a lot of different policies and permits and special uses and everything. So um, obviously we've got some uh, people on here. So there's interest um, and I think everybody has these issues at some point in time. And if you haven't run into it, then now you can hear what some of those issues might be that come up. Um, right. So, no, I think this is a great form. So I appreciate you having this um, discussion. Great. Thanks. Brad, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So Brad Harrington with Wright County Parks and Rec. I'm also part of Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails on the board. Um, yeah, this is a, it's always a fun topic to see what everybody else is doing and how it's kind of being handled as far as park permits and special use permits and those kind of things. So that's who I am. Thanks. I'm just going to go around now. Uh, Patrick. Hey, everybody. My name is Patrick Menton. I'm the Assistant Recreation Director with the City of Winona. I'm very interested in the topic. We recently uh, had to create a policy for commercial use, use authorizations as well as uh, revamped our donation application because uh, our parks, too, started to turn into what looked like a cemetery with headstones. So we had to put a stop to that. And I want to add that this photo is an undoctored photo that was emailed to us uh, of a big lake here in Winona. So pretty, pretty cool. Nice. And Kathy. Hello, I'm Kathy George with the City of Sandstone. One of our crowning jewels is Robinson Park, um, which has a lot of climbing activity, both in the summer and the winter. And that has, you know, kind of pushed us into having a policy for commercial use of Robinson Park. We also have the wild and scenic Kettle River going through there. So we have rafters coming up and tours and guides, I guess you'd say. But uh, more recently, um, we do, since you mentioned the bench idea, we, we are getting more people calling, wanting to do memorials. And um, it can be a little overwhelming. And then we are just creating a memorial tree park in the name of a um, very prominent um, citizen who passed away and had recommended that before. And so we're, we're working on that and we need to develop policies and procedures for that as well. 
So this was perfect timing. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Good. I'm glad it worked out. Um, ben. Yeah, Ben Anderson, Stearns County Parks Director and also the Vice Chair for the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Board. Um, yeah, lots of policies floating around and there's always new ones uh, that we're not thinking about or new things coming through the door. Like, uh, for instance, we're getting some pretty, um, <clears throat> uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we're getting some pressure on slack lines um within our parks out here and stretching them over some of our swimming quarries and stuff so just some discussion later on slack lines and what that might look like and, and if other people are seeing them or not is what i'm looking for today along with you know other updates to other policies and how people handle things so uh jeff yeah hi i'm jeff fees uh, i work with the city of rochester parks and recreation department and yeah, it was, uh, I kind of handle this type of thing for us. So um, I inherited some policies and I'm interested to hear what others have to say about that and if we need to modify or <clears throat> improve ours. So thanks. Hi, Joe. Hello, everybody. Gina, thank you. I'm Joe Chupesky. I'm the system plan coordinator for the partner agency, Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission, and uh, very interested in this topic. Um, not only am I actively involved, of course, with a lot of connecting people to the outdoors activities for the commission, uh, but I also happen to be involved with a lot of park events just in my own community. So uh, just curious to see what everybody else is doing. Thanks. And hi, Sarah. Hi there, I'm Sarah and I'm from the city of Hutchinson. I'm park supervisor here. Um, so I logged in today and I, I was just kind of curious as we were discussing things actually yesterday, um, how to handle ongoing requests for um, especially memorial benches. We do, we've started that program here in Hutchinson a few years back, starting in our library square. Um, and we also have had a, a memorial tree program for years here at Hutchinson that was started by our former forester. Um, but just kind of wanting to see what other communities have out there for the actual policies. And I guess one of my bigger questions is, is somebody purchases a bench in our parks, how long is it good for? Like, is it forever? Or, or is there like a, a time span that we've been, you know, that other communities give individuals that are interested? Good questions. So I hope to get to that. Hi, Mary Jo. Hi there. Here I am. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Mary Jo Knutson. I'm an administrative specialist with the City of Wauwatosa Park and Rec and working mainly with um, park maintenance. Thank you. And then we have uh, EDA. Can you introduce yourself? Well, they might be tied up at the moment. So I would say let's go ahead and start our discussion. I heard a couple of people mention um, benches. So what I might do is um, just start. Can you um, allow me to share? OK. Um, maybe start by showing you um, what we came up with for options for people to choose from. I just have to get the right screen up. Okay, bear with me. I went into forestry because I didn't want to work with computers and look at me. I went into park so I didn't have to wear a tie. <laughs> and you probably don't have to, do you? Nope. Okay, it's not bringing up the screen I want. 
Um, let me try one more time. There we go. Okay. So if you can see that, um, we came up with um, three options for memorials. One is the block bench, which is a um, bench made out of solid um, limestone uh, with engraving not filled. People can also um, have the option of selecting a black granite, um, and that would be more fitting in like a, a maintained area or turf, um, which we don't honestly have a lot of in our parks, um, but we do have that option there as well. And then um, we also have a more rustic option called the Aldo Leopold bench, which is my favorite. Um, and that is um, a little bit lower price point and it also is really fitting um, on a more remote rustic vista um, and might be more complementary to um, certain personalities um, people are wanting to remember. And then we have a memorial tree and plaque option as well. Um, so those, those are our three options. Um, and this is just a simple application form um, that people will fill out online, um, putting in what they want it to read, and then they'll get to also proof it. So I'll stop sharing. And then Carlin, if I may, um, I'm going to share um, what you showed me for your memorials, and you can talk as I show things. How's that sound? Yep, that sounds good. Um, so we were getting a ton of benches. Um, we, we had a lot of benches in our park and in the zoo already, and so people would pay to have the plaque put on their name, and it was a pretty small price point. I think it was any donations over $500 um, could get a bench with their name on it. Um, and we were just coming up with, you know, well, and there was also the trees. A lot of people wanted to plant a tree in honor of a loved one. Um, and that was, that, got, that gets difficult because sometimes the tree doesn't make it and the tree dies right away. So then do you, I mean, do you have to replace it um, and pay for the replacement of that? Um, we've had trees that got struck by lightning and we've got trees that, you know, got, um, hit by strong winds or, or whatever else. So a tree is one of those things that can somewhat easily be taken out um, or just not make it. So with the overrun of benches, it was kind of starting to look a little ridiculous, especially in our zoo area. So we said, you know, what if we just have this one centralized location for all dedications and memorials um, in, and they pay for um, $250 or more of a donation can have um, a leaf with their name engraved on it. Um, so you can see the picture of what we call three of our tombs, our, our limes, limestone tombstones. They do kind of look like a tombstone, um, our tablets, I guess we call them. Um, and we kind of did an artistic design for, for branches on there, tree branches, and then um, each person can purchase a leaf if they want. And this whole area is kind of a circular area right outside of one of our um, natural playgrounds, which is a very busy area. So that was another enticing thing to say, you know, your dedications can go in this area and it's, a, it's very visible. A lot of people can see it. It's not within the zoo. So you can actually see it any time of the day, not just during zoo hours. And so that's kind of how we help promote that um, versus doing a park bench. Yeah. So there's the big, huge Circle. So we have years and years um, of space left on those to be able to fill dedications and memorials. Um, and uh, we have a we have a different one. This this particular one is at Oxbow Park in Zolman Zoo, and we have a different um, dedication area, which you can see right here. That's at our Chester Woods Park, and this is um, through. They created a little area called the Legacy um, Trail. Uh, it's an area with several of these structures like this, plus a little bridge by the lake and some seating areas, just kind of almost like a quiet resting area within the park. Um, but again, a little different structure, but it's the same leaf um, that people can purchase. It's a brass leaf, and we have someone in the area that, that does the engraving for us. Um, and again, anything over $250 donation to the park, they can get one of these leaves if they want. 
Um, so that was really our way of centralizing um, dedications and donations. So they weren't all over the park um, in just benches everywhere. Um, we do still have it in a policy. We, we went a little farther and we have a whole naming policy. Um, so people just can't randomly name buildings in the county or um, have names all over the place. Um, but within that, our policy states that you can do a bench or a table or a tree, but they are not intended to be permanent and will not continue after the lifespan of that amenity. So that's how, kind of how we get around. Like if a bench is typically going to last 10 years, you tell the people, okay, you get, you get your name on this bench for 10 years. And then beyond that is not expected that it will still be there. Um, and we really just try and steer people away from trees at this point um, and just tell them there's a good chance your tree could die or um, you know a new disease could come along and that that tree's only going to last five years you just it's much more unpredictable as far as a tree so then we just steer them the dedication area route instead yeah and for our benches um it is the cost of the dedication includes um, general maintenance for the life of said object. So, I mean, a limestone or a granite bench is probably going to have a pretty long life, um, but the Aldo Leopold bench is probably, you're probably looking at a 20 year lifespan. So, and then there, the onus is not on the county to replace it. It's just through the life of the object that it would, that it would remain there. Regina, if you were to get someone that comes along and doesn't like the family that de dedicated our, you know, worst case scenario, some comes with a sledgehammer and decides to take out that bench, is it understood that then you would you don't replace it at that point for the memorial? I, you know, let me look at the language while someone else talks. Because uh. that's a tricky one. Because that. Yeah. Sometimes things can get easily damaged or. Oh, I just found it. Yes. Yep, it says if object is damaged due to vandalism or becomes unusable due to premature age or weathering or is stolen, the county is not responsible for replacing it. So I think we've had that dedication, the limestone tablet area. I think we've had that now for um, four or five years. And I would say we have maybe four of those tablets filled with leaves. Um, so people like the idea um, and it really is, was not difficult to get them to go that route versus doing the bench. But I think how you market it makes a, a big deal um, and how you know nice the area looks to the fact that it was outside accessible right next to a parking lot and available to the public at all times was kind of nice to people too. So most most parks are going to be like that, but you know, we had a lot of memorials tucked within the zoo that was only open from 10 to 4 every day. So if you have a loved one and you can only get there in the evenings, you can't really see their bench. So, so do you post those locations somewhere online? So if a person is looking for some opportunities to donate, like can they pull up a map and see that you know this park has these opportunities? Or yeah, we don't actually have it on a map. Um, might be a good idea to do that. Um, but that's one of those where we um, just recommend calling and talking to the park manager, kind of a thing. Do you allow people, let's let's say they've purchased a tree and they got the plaque and all that, do you allow people to adorn the tree with um, with whatever it may be? I mean, we're, Winona was getting out of hand, so we no longer allow plaques or anything, but they still do it, planting flowers and colored rocks and pinwheels and all this stuff. And it's a real pain for maintenance to mow around and things like that. So how do you, how do you handle those issues? actually haven't had trouble with that issue. Um, surprisingly, <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't thought of that. Um, we don't allow them to, to attach the plaques right to the tree and we typically have a tree barrier with a plaque on it, but we have not really had that issue where they come and try and 
do decorations or, or adorn it? So I can speak a little bit to that because we've had some of those issues. Um, unfortunately, the ones that we've had those issues with were memorials that went in that aren't necessarily the best for the park, um, but we still worked with them on putting the bench in. Prime example, we have a park south of Buffalo <clears throat> that we had a lady that was found dead. It was one of the murders that happened out here a couple of years ago. Family wanted to put a bench in and then they wanted to adorn it and do all these different things to it. And it's, they wanted to put it right at the park entrance. And not really the first thing you want somebody to see when they pull into the park as a reminder of somebody that was killed there. Um, so we put the bench in, got the in honor of and memory of our normal bench policy. And then we did tell them that if we find stuff on the bench that we will remove it. Um, just because we have a 10 year maintenance agreement or a 20 year maintenance agreement, depending on what they choose to do when they fund the bench. <clears throat> and part of that is, is we have to maintain the standard that we have. Um, they did ask about planting a flower bed around a tree because they did a tree in the same location. And we told them that you plant flowers around it, we're not responsible for it. If they get mowed over, they get mowed over. Um, that's kind of the way we approach it. And yeah, they got hit a couple of times and mowed over, taken down and they get upset, but we just kind of always pointed back to it. This is what we agreed to. This is what we did. Um, so we don't allow for it to happen. We try to maintain that as much as possible because that's part of our agreement that we do. Uh, the other one that we have is the impromptu memorials. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with too. They just randomly show up without any policies. And of course, those are always real fun when you've got flowers and cards and everything else memorializing somebody that passed away or something like that and pulling all that up. And usually the, with those kind of things, we'll grab them, we pull them in and we'll try to contact somebody that we can catch a name off of and say, look, it's here at our office. We'll hold it for a week. And if you're not here within a week, we're throwing it away. And that's, even with the ones that have been on the memorial bench, we'll do that. We'll pull them off. If it's something that's a substance, like they'll hang lanterns, we'd call the people that were in charge of the bench and tell them, look, we pulled these off. You know, you got a week, come get them from us. If we don't see you in a week, then we're going to throw them away. That's how we do it. Anyone have any other things to add about benches and memorials? What about um, naming? Naming rights to a park or a pavilion or a park amenity. Can I mention something about the benches? I didn't unmute in time. Oh yeah, of course. It's Mary Jo from Oatana. We just redid our park and our memorial and donation policy within the last year or two. And one of the things we did is we didn't have a lot of records from previous benches. And we had some of those aggregate benches that just kind of fall apart after so many years. So our policy is there's a life expectancy. And at the end of that life expectancy, then the family that has it has the opportunity to renew and replace or we can go out and resell the memorial bench area. That's a good idea. And we did have um, Kirk Kramer from Sleepy Eye. When I asked him to introduce himself, he had somebody in his office and then we've had another person join us. So if I can just pause and ask for um, those two to introduce themselves, I'll have Kirk go first. If he's available now. Okay, we'll have Lynn. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Lynn Newman, City of Hutchinson. Okay, thank you. And EDA is the EDA coordinator for the City of Sleepy Eye, Kirk Kramer. So thank you. All right. So we'll dive back into our discussion. Um, thanks, Mary Jo, for adding that. That's really helpful. That's a, a good idea to recontact the, the family or the donor and offer it up again. Um, does anyone else have anything on benches before we start talking about 
Well, I've got a follow up question for MJ or anybody that's had to do that. I mean, we're in a similar position with a handful of these aggregate benches that are that are falling apart. But how do we how do we or how do you do that? Reach out to the family and just say, hey, we're going to, you know, we'll give you six months to get a new one or we're going to eliminate it. How do you do that? Ours actually happened on an aggregate um, drinking fountain. And so that was kind of falling apart. And we called the family. It was actually out at the golf course and they were still golfers out there. We knew who the family was. And we said, this has to come down. And this is our new policy that we implemented. And you know, we know you didn't have it X amount of years ago, but this is what we need to do going forward. We hope you understand. And they gathered the family up and purchased the new uh, purchased the new drinker that was ADA accessible and then we gave them actually the little plaque it had their it had their loved one's face on it that we couldn't reuse so we gave that to them and then we paid for like the installation they just paid for the item itself yeah it seems like with these policies they're quite a bit easier when you set it and move forward with it, but it's um, it's in retrospect uh, trying to go back and fix some of these issues that, that have started. So that's kind of the, the fine tuning human element. I think we were lucky. <laughs> I could see where that would be very sticky, especially when you say, well, this is our policy. Well, I just talked to blah, blah in 1975 and he said it was fine, you know, so. We are dealing with some of that, but we haven't had to haven't had to deal a lot with it. We've been lucky. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for those of you who are doing benches, is there some sort of a identification or plaque on the bench, or do you allow them to do anything? You know that memorializes, you know, whoever they're doing that for, or, because currently we have, we have a, a bronze plaque that we, when, a, when someone wants to do a memorial, a, a new one, a new bench, um, you know, we'll coordinate pouring a concrete pad and putting a bronze plaque in the concrete and then, um, you know, set the bench and, I'm kind of wondering what happens when that bench, the lifespan, like we've talked about, um, it deteriorates, but we still got the plaque there and the bench is falling apart and we remove that. So I'm just curious how or if anyone is allowing kind of a, a naming or text or things like that. Well, we have um, our options include um, sandblasted engraving so i don't know am i showing the right screen i never know okay I think so. um so on the wood it's uh, a filled engraving and on the uh, limestone or granite it's not filled it's just um, sandblasted so that's on the bench itself which i think works out well for the we very have, reason you're stating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a plaque that goes on the bench itself that we have an option of two different benches. One of them doesn't have a plaque and we do have something along the base, a little sign like you do. And then our other one is a courtyard bench with a memorial plaque that goes right into the bench. So we can actually pre-order some of the benches they come with the blank plaques. We have a place in town that does them. We just slap it on when we have one. Yeah, we did something similar in Winona. Uh, our, our attempt was to unify the look in the parks. And we had so many different styles of benches and park furniture and plaques uh, that we went to one brand only and then uh, one line within the brand. So we use Anova Furnishings. It's based out of out, out east somewhere, but it's actually manufactured in Winona. Um, and then uh, we mount a plaque to the concrete and we use the same, we sit, same plaque, same font, same everything for everybody to unify the look. 
Yeah, we use the recycled timber. One same thing. We just try to limit this is what your one option is, and then we engrave just on the timbers. And so, again, I referenced earlier, we have our price option includes either a 10 year maintenance plan or a 20 year maintenance plan. And so, once that's 10 year or 20 years up, you know, if the bench is still in good shape, nobody's replacing it, we'll leave it there. But if somebody comes to us and wants to put another bench in and we know that 10 year agreement's up, we got, we'll just, we can put another one in there. That's kind of how we operate with that. That way we don't have those plaques and stuff like that. Kind of hard to move. So it, it would be nice if maybe everyone on this call could send their policies to one spot and then we could share them because it's we don't have these policies and we should have them. It'd be really great. <laughs> Carlin, is that something that we could do? Um, do on the website, create a place with policy links? We might be able to do that. We might be able to have a link where we can have a, a folder full of um, templates or, or already drafted documents that people can kind of pull from and look at for different things. Um, we'll remember to talk about that the next communication meeting to see if that's a link that we can add to the directly to the GMPT website. Yeah, but okay, sounds good. Um, so do we want to talk about um, people's experience with um, park naming? Because I think that that's a big one that we're trying to steer people away from. Crickets. I know we have a building in town for an example that was a county school district collaborative and it was called the John Wright building or it still is the John Wright building after the mayor at the time and um, since then the counties um, and school have pulled out the cities bought the building and we're revamping it for our street shop and a daycare center and a community center so the discussion is is it still the John Wright building? Are we committed to keeping that name? The county built a new building and they have a John Wright conference room there. So is that, you know, how do you handle that? And without, without a policy, um, people are awkward and uncomfortable. They feel like, well, his widow is still alive. You know, <laughs> do you just take the name off the building? So I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear others' experiences. Our naming rates in Oatana go through city council, actually. So someone can propose a naming right on something, then it has to go through staff. Then it goes through like the board most closely associated. So park board or like our West Hills commission or something. Then it goes to city council. City council will actually have a public hearing for it. Um, and then there's opposition, there's criteria of um, what's expected, you know, is it historical or culturally significant? Um, and then if it's someone for an individual who is deceased, it won't be considered unless that person has been deceased for at least three years or it shows exceptional contributions. Um, there's quite a, quite a variety and like corporate logos or graphic identifiers are not permitted on signage relating to the naming rights. Um, that's that's similar to how our policy provides for naming rights. Um, it first it goes through staff, then it goes through our county commissioners, um, and it also has pretty strict strict criteria. So, and we only have one park that is named after the family who um, the land was purchased from because they donated half the value of it and at the time that was just negotiated there was no policy in place that was more than a decade ago so we're going through something quite interesting we're getting a miracle field and an inclusive playground it was a grassroots group that did a lot of the fundraising and they kind of made up their own rules without necessarily getting a rubber stamp from the city saying it's okay. So apparently that playground is named, the field is named, but it wasn't necessarily the highest contributors. So we're going through 
that process right now. Our grand opening is July 19th, so we have to get it ironed out by then. But that's kind of a, that's a sticky one right now. It's been a project for a couple of years. The staff person that promised some of those things is no longer here. So it's, yeah, interesting. So if anybody has that kind of experience, please let us know. Okay, if we want to move on to other policies, if we want to start talking about maybe the special events or um, the what Ben brought up with the, what did you call them, the lines? Yeah, slack line. So essentially just a big ratchet strap that they tie between two anchor points and they can get quite long. Um, I think you see, or at least I've seen some things in documentaries like out west, like where they stretch them over canyons and things. So things can get huge. But the issue we're having is that our two swimming quarries is they want to stretch them over the top of those. Well, we haven't been allowing it because we're saying, well, you're deterring that area from other visitors. You could fall on somebody, you could hurt somebody, you know, they're most populated areas. But now just recently, I think maybe two, three weeks ago, I got a real formal email from an organization in Minnesota requesting um, to sit down and have more of a discussion um, about what slack lining might look like within our park. And within Quarry Park here, you know, we do have rock climbing. Um, we do have scuba diving. So we do have special um, permits and uh, guidelines surrounding those, you know, but I was just curious if other people have heard of the slack lining or have, are having issues with it or seeing it within their parks, um, maybe more so down around that they're climbing areas. Um, I think down by sandstone, I think it was, it was mentioned earlier, so. Uh, here in Winona, we just put in um, two climate purpose-built climbing boulders. Each one's a 10,000 pound boulder um, for um, not going up on it. That's what the little kids do, but climbing around it. And then in this park, uh, we've got plans to do, to have slack line poles installed. Uh, hard thing is we can't, we haven't been able to find a vendor who makes them yet. It's a lot like a hammock kind of pole, but um, something that would support the stress that those lines do. So uh, we're getting some custom built for the application, um, but our, our intent is to not allow slack lines to be put up indefinitely. So it's something that the user would bring on their own, pitch them up, take them down. Um, but then similar to um, hammocks, we would designate where they can and cannot use them. Not that that gets followed very often, but at least with that boulder and park, it fits the nature and intended use of that park. And is there any permitting process for the use of those areas or is it just use it your own risk? Yeah, just a free public park. And we have damage. Sorry, is there any time. damage at the, at the attachment points that they're creating? By, I, I just, I'm not sure how they attach and how if, if they're digging holes or if they're, what, I mean, how are they attaching? So the ones that I've seen, they just wrap it around a tree, like you'd see a hammock and they have, you know, certain, uh, some of them do, some of them don't have things that help mitigate damage to trees and things like that. The other interesting, when I was out here looking around our climbing area, so way back when, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, when the climbing first started out here at Quarry Park, that actually a climbing group came in and put an anchor uh, bolts for our climbers. We don't maintain them. We're very clear we don't maintain them. It's a responsibility of the climber to make sure they're in good working condition. But I found new ones that I assume are for slack lines um, out here the other day. So, um, but so I think there is a potential for some damage. You know, if the poles, like you know Patrick was talking about, you know, I would assume that those are pretty safe. But for natural features, yeah, I would for sure think you'd have to watch that. Yeah, we have similar issues with the hammocks going up. Um, people will hook them on any limb or tree, and some of them are just not suitable for supporting that weight. Like we've got a grove of cherry trees um, for our Masato relationship with Japan, and uh, council was not happy with all these hammocks going up in there. So we had to put signage in that area saying, don't do it here. But then we also put signage that says where you can do it. And then in that area, we put, there's some like, 
protective kind of straps so you can put on the trees. Um, then that way people can hook the hammocks up to those straps and trying to direct people to the right place to use it. Um, but I wonder if there's a, like a similar style strap that could be wrapped around a tree in, in those popular uh, slack line areas too that might exist. Ben, are you uh, working on um, providing for that more formal discussion with the group that contacted you? Yeah, so one of our staff, Sarah, she'll be meeting with uh, somebody on the 12th to go around out here and look and just have a discussion about it. Um, it hasn't been pressed real hard, but I think it's going to be, it's going to come, going to come down the line. And I was just curious if others had seen or heard much about it, so. This is a natural area out here, so we I don't think we'll put in any sort of artificial poles or things like that out here to, you know, support that. Who knows? Maybe we will. I don't know where the discussion will go. Um, but I did find it interesting that there were some anchor points that were already finding their way in here um, within our rock climbing area. So I don't know if they're trying to run under that permit or or, or what that looks like, but. Okay. Um, anything else on that? What about um, other types of special events or special uses or public use? Well, I was going to go back to some of that slack line real quick, uh, just because of past experience. So, Ben, what I can tell you on that, you know, the whole point of slack lines, it's really more for balance, those kind of things. That's what they're for in those kind of games. So, if they're one to put them where they're over your quarries, Typically, the recommended heights on slack lines is only one and a half to two feet off the ground. And the recommended distance is only about 10 to 20 feet long. So if you start getting past this, a lot of that stuff, I mean, that should help you quite a bit as far as dealing with the quarries. If you're, you know, you tell them, yeah, you can put them up, but they can only be one and a half to two feet off the ground. They can't be more than 20 feet long. They're not scanning any of those quarries. Uh, that's just from past history and working with slack lines and dealing with ropes courses and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't know if that helps you or not, but I know if you kind of go look and just look at typical slack like guidelines, you'll see that as a pretty common one. Yeah, no, I mean, the ones are stretching across the quarries. They've got to be pushing 75 to 100 feet in length so right. to get them across there. So and you, can, and you can always hit them with, you could also go with some of the OSHA stuff that because once you get over certain heights, then they're required to have safety harnesses and all that other stuff. So and other safety gear. So that's why it's that one. It's like bouldering, like you, Patrick, you mentioned with the bouldering rocks. Those bouldering rocks, they're, if you're above 10 feet, then you're not bouldering. So everything, your hands aren't supposed to be above 10 feet when you're bouldering, from what I remember. And so that's why they don't have to wear helmets. That's why they don't have to be into their, in their harnesses. That's why they don't have to be hooked up uh, because you're below that OSHA standard of that 10 foot line. Like you just past, don't take me to the bank on it, but some good points to kind of start looking at. That was really good information. Thank you, Brad. Um, so I know Ben and Brad both have um, special event or public use or uh, sort of policies in place. Do you want to maybe talk about how those came about or what they, at least what they include? Yeah, I can go first. I guess I don't really know how it came about. You know, I just, we have the Lake Wobegon Trail and we, we see a lot of people that host uh, the Lake Wobegon Trail Marathon, lots of 5Ks. Um, we've got a triathlon that happens within our park and, you know, lots of other smaller events. So um, up to, I think it was in 2018 is when we revisited um, our event policy and essentially um, the, the, the quick and dirty of what we require is that um, when the county is not a co-sponsor, uh, the event sponsor shall provide the following insurance coverage for events with participants of 30 or more. And our requirement is a million and a half per occurrence and three million aggregate. And that came from our, the MCIT, Minnesota County Insurance Trust and their recommendations and obviously the review and recommendations from our county attorney's office. Uh, we also require that individual participants of the event sign a liability waiver. 
that we provide them for the county. So for a lot of these events, we get pushback, not only on the insurance requirements of the million and a half and three million, because we're told there is no half a million dollar policies. It's, you know, they have to bump it up. Essentially, they got to take out a million, two million, and then add a, um, a million dollar, um, um, I can't think of the word right now, um, whatever, additional million dollar uh, policy. Rider, for rider. umbrella. Um, Umbrella, there you go, thank you, um, to, to, to hit that. And, and for a yearly, it can be fairly expensive and, and stuff, but the liability waiver, yeah, the other complaint we get on the liability waiver is they need to sign ours and also the organization. So come, sometimes they're like, well, we've got so many waivers. Well, if you're gonna have our event, that's what you have to do within ours. And then also we have a um, events that raise funds or require a registration fee. Uh, we have a revenue sharing um, part in our policy, which is for profit for profit organizations, 10% of the gross registration fees, not to exceed $500. And then for nonprofit, that gets bumped down to 5% of the gross registration fee, not to exceed $200. Um, so um, that's kind of the quick and dirty of our event policy when people are, are using our parks and trails for events. So we're very similar to what Ben's done. We're, we're not quite as advanced as he is with some of those because we're still kind of developing. Uh, a lot of ours in the past were handled on just word of mouth agreements, very limited on what was coming in. We do operate a triathlon, but that triathlon is also a partnership with the county, uh, with our department. So there's a few things that we're able to kind of move there. Where our biggest issue has come into recently, and this is why we're really, we're in the process of evaluating all this is disc golf courses. We have two of them that are 18 hole disc golf courses in our county. And at one point in the span of one week, I think I had eight or nine requests to host tournaments at those parks. And I was like, eh, okay, we, we're, we're gonna put a stop to this until we can figure out what's going on. Um, but we do, I started requiring all the insurance requirements, same stuff that Ben was doing. Um, we are looking at our fees right now and what we're going to require. So those are still kind of new things for us. So Gina, I wish I could be more of a help, but really we've been talking with Ben and kind of looking at a lot of his policies and kind of adjusting to kind of what works for within our county and within our system um, and starting to develop those because a lot of it has been Okay, let's look at it. Yep. Yeah, it's a need. We don't have that in the county. Yeah, we can work with you. Okay, let's figure out a way to make it happen. Um, been very kind of under the table type stuff until recently. And that's kind of a good segue into talking about um, like a policy needs analysis. If that, if anyone has done kind of a, a formal analysis of what policies would be appropriate for their park system? Anyone? Brad did, you, Brad, did you include anything like that within you? I know you're going through your full county parks master plan. Is there anything included in that? Uh, yeah. So some of that will be hit on. So as Ben mentioned, as a county, just as a parks department, we've kind of taken on this year, we are doing a full comprehensive plan just for our department looking at system wide. Um, so one of those things we don't know if we're being smart or if we're shooting ourselves, but it is what it is. Uh, but that will probably be part of it because they are evaluating everything from staffing to um, gaps in our system to future needs, you know, how we're operating. So they're looking at everything. So I'm sure some of that will come up in. Uh, have we addressed it specifically so far? No, but um, they have asked for a lot of that information on how we operate. So. So that's, that's part of that operations discussion. So good yeah, job. in 2022, we'll be doing a, a park and trails systems master plan. So my thought was to kind of fold that policy needs assessment into that. Um, seems like the most logical thing to do. Um, we have about nine minutes left. So are there policies um, that weren't brought up today that you have or are thinking about developing? Maybe we could talk about any of those. We need to develop all these. <laughs> we 
we do have the commercial use it's in our ordinance and we charge if you're going to have three or more events or more than three events in a year it's a hundred dollars and if you have um, three or less it's fifty dollars and that's just to try to know who's using our park as far as the climbing guides is mostly what it is or schools but we have a special event permit as well um, just so we know who's using our parks and what support they might need but those don't have a, a cost to them the other big one we've dealt with i'm sure you guys have seen is food trucks dealing with food truck vendors and them wanting to come in and how do you permit that and how do you do all that stuff so that's another one that we actually have developed and so we have a a year-long permit that we we'll, we have identified what parks specifically will allow food trucks to come in and where they can be there. Uh, so if anybody contacts us and asks, even if it's somebody that, hey, we're having a baby shower at your facility, we'd like to have a food truck come in, can we do that? Yep, here's the policy. They need to submit their permits here and make sure all that's taken care of and this is the cost. We kept it pretty low. It's like $100 for the whole year. Uh, and then they'd have to renew it every year. So that's another one that we're dealing with. We're in the process of developing a um, private use in the parks agreement. We're going through kind of our park commission to figure it out, but we have an astronomy club that wants to come in and set up in one of our parks and is as extensive as creating um, telescope concrete pads and having a shed on the site so that they can continually have programs. Um, and then we also had a, a ski team that wanted to use our lake access as for all their shows and practices. And so we've, we've kind of had to start coming up with a, a policy towards these private organizations utilizing the parks on a more permanent basis. And so we're still in, still trying to work that one out, get the kinks out and everything, but we've got a lot of it in place, but we, we now still need to kind of make the agreement contract side of it and, and kind of deciding who should be in our parks doing that kind of thing and not and a lot of it goes back to is it something that supports our parks mission and would be public programs that we would support so yeah that's another big one we've been working on that's always a good rule of thumb to just go back to your mission statement and cross check it so to speak um, any final thoughts before we close out the forum for today? Well, thanks everybody for joining in. Um, it was a really good discussion. I learned a lot um, and I look forward to getting together with the communications committee and we'll work on um, getting some information centralized for the membership so that it's accessible. Um, and we'll include in a newsletter when, when we've been able to make that happen. So I did put my email in the chat. If you want to just email me the policies you've got, um, I'll keep track of them, Carlin, and we can talk about it next time we meet. Great. Okay. Thanks again, Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. See you.